Good morning, everyone. Yeah, so uh, my name is Rick O'Connor. Uh, some, I, th I know many of the faces in the room from my past life running the Risk Five Foundation. And uh, this past spring, we uh, started a new organization. Uh, I'm now uh, an implementer of the Risk Five ISA, which is awesome. I uh, spent the last four years signing membership agreements on the left-hand side and then had the pleasure of becoming a member of the Risk Five Foundation and signing the membership agreement on the right-hand side uh, earlier this spring. So that's pretty cool. So um, how many people here have actually uh, read the Risk Five spec? Great. How many, how many have a project implementing Risk Five? A few, yeah, fewer. Uh, that's good. So I'm going to give like a real probably two-minute introduction to the RISC-V ISA and the parts of it that I think are the most interesting and why, why there's momentum behind the adoption of the ISA. And then I'm going to talk about, you know, in the, in the chip industry, we've had sort of this siren song of open source on the, on the rocky shores of our journey for a long time. And why can't we, in the hardware space, like the software brethren, take advantage of open source uh, methods and philosophy in SOC design. Uh, so I'll talk about those challenges a little bit and what, what might be some of the opportunities to overcome those challenges. And then specifically, what we're doing in the open hardware group, the core five family of cores from the great guys at, uh, at the Pulp platform and ETH Zurich, give you, a, give you a quick status update on where we are with launching this organization. So I think this is a familiar slide to uh, many of you. I've, I used this slide uh, many, many times in the past uh, when I was given risk five talks. And any modern SOC today, not just uh, a Tiger SOC from NVIDIA, has dozens and dozens of cores on the SOC. And quite often, upwards of half a dozen, if not more, completely different ISAs uh, on, on those cores. Many of the cores aren't exposed through the API to the user. They're completely embedded, if you will, with a, their own software stack that needs to be supported. And to be honest, it's a bit of an engineering nightmare. If, if we didn't have uh, legacy that we're integrating into these SOCs, and, and we came up with a design that looks like this, as systems engineers, you know, our, our boss should just shoot us and you know, send us out the door. So, do we need so many ISAs? And do they need to be proprietary, right? Well, obviously, no. What if there was something like this RISC-V thing that was simple uh, and far smaller, easier to, di to digest, uh, has no microarchitectural techniques built into the specification that presuppose what your, what your implementation is going to look like? And these next two bullets are probably the most in interesting reasons for why RISC-V is being adopted. Uh, the modularity. Uh, we, have, we have a challenge in the semiconductor industry. I don't want to get into a physics debate of whether or not Moore's law is dead, but let's just take for a second that it is. And the only way to achieve performance gains is through new architectural techniques. We need to do things a little differently than what we've done in the past. Part of the challenges with some of the legacy ISAs is that they're one contiguous list of instructions that you must have in order to be compliant with the ISA. Well, RISC-V changes that paradigm, right? It's a modular standard set of extensions that you use only what you need to handle the data loads that you're, that you're, uh, that you're interested in, the data payloads that you're interested in. So that modularity uh, is, is very interesting. And on top of that, you can extend it with your own custom instructions. So it take advantage of that modularity by having a reserved opcode space that will never get trampled on, that you can implement in your own secret sauce and special instructions to run your own algorithm and, and so on. And that is very interesting. The other aspect that's kind of cool about these extensions is helps us with stability. So even if we baked something wrong into a released and ratified extension, it will not change. It will live on, warts and all, forever. We can correct those kind of maybe mistakes in a future extension. So if you have a device that implements this original extension that has uh, you know, some errata associated with it, that will always be supported in production forever and ever, and that's great. You could then uh, develop a new device that could take advantage of the new extension that, that, that maybe looked after that. So that stability is important as well. And these, you know, many extensions, 
um, that that carve up the, the different functionality. And a way I for for gray-haired guys like me um, that are in the audience, you're probably familiar with a green card or at least the assembly card that you stuffed in your back pocket if you were working on old IBM machines, or you know some deck machines flipping sw boot switches on the front of a PDP-8 or PDP-11. You kind of walked around with those things. And nothing highlights the simplicity of the RISC-V ISA more than building your own green card, right? So here's the 32-bit um, integer instructions. That's kind of hard to read on this screen, but it's really quite legible. Uh, I think the fonts got mixed up. Yeah, 14 more instructions for privilege mode, uh, another handful uh, for multiply divides, uh, 11 for atomics, the uh, floating point in, in various widths, that compress mode, and then re you know a step and repeat for uh, for 64 and 128 across the card, and then you can build out your green card, right? And that's the whole ISA, and this is literally attached into one of the uh, Patterson and Hennessy, the latest Patterson and Hennessy textbook as a tearaway for for students in academia. So it's pretty cool. All right, that's good. Uh, so hooray for a free and open ISA because it really paves the way for a, a whole raft of innovation, as we'll, as we'll see in a moment. What are some of the cost drivers, though, if we change gears a little bit and just look at the development costs associated with an SOC? Upwards of 90%, if you add up the pie, uh, the pie pieces for software, the actual RTL design, the verification, the physical design, upwards of 90% of the, uh, the effort are, are uh, caught up in those four areas. And for highly differentiated IP blocks that really drive a unique selling point for that SOC, that makes a lot of sense. But if everybody's using the same cores anyway, um, maybe there's an opportunity to take advantage of some sharing in the ecosystem in order to tackle that problem. So a general purpose CPU core with an effective open source licensing model would be potentially quite interesting. But are you gonna bet your badge, are you gonna walk into your boss's office, put your badge on the desk and say, hey, I got an idea. Let's tape, tape out our next you know, multi-million dollar mass set device that we're going to run in volume production on this core that I found online in a GitHub repo developed by some cool guys at the university that kicked out Albert Einstein. Right. You know, Zurich. Um, probably not, right? So there's, there's an IP quality concern. There's a roadmap concern. It's great that there's this one core uh, that I can get, um, but you know, what's the support going to look like? How well is it verified? Those are those are significant challenges. And then on top of that, there's the ecosystem because if you're going to uh, put a core into your SOC, there's a tool chain issue. Uh, what what OSs or RTOSs have been ported to it? Um, is what what kind of quality am I going to get out of this? Is you know, what are the PPA metrics? Is it a, is it a really uh, is it really a piece of IP that would look like a commercial piece of IP that I uh, would typically license? And then speaking of license, do I have to give it back if I make a change, if I make a tweak, I do something innovative like we talked about before and you put a custom, you know, some custom instructions in there or whatever, I'm like, like what, are the, what are the licensing conditions? So permissive use, if we really want these, um, these open source artifacts to be adopted in high volume implementations, we, we need to not legislate giving it back, we need to incent giving it back by the fact that we've got a healthy ecosystem, right? So the license has to be permissive if, you, if we expect large semiconductor companies to, to participate. And my experience around driving open initiatives is you absolutely need to have the very large players in the ecosystem participating. So, we flip back to what RISC-V has done in this space, right? It's really, because it's a free and open ISA, uh, Frank and I could start a new processor company in his kitchen tomorrow, right? We don't have to talk to anybody. We can download this back, start innovating away. It's really unleashed a completely new frontier of innovation in this space, something that has really not been seen ever in the processor space. And that's a really good thing. But on the flip side of that is, if you think about the available resources uh, throughout the ecosystem, independent of our processor architecture and implementations, but just if you think about all the people who work 
on tool change, software porting, OS, OS porting, uh, even verification work. Of, of that resource, that, that, that is a finite amount of resource. The more cores of different architecture, uh, of the same architecture, but the more cores we throw into that resource pool, all that we're doing to ourselves is splintering up the pool and making it harder and harder to achieve critical mass. And if you think back to the early days of Linux, there were literally dozens and dozens of Linux distributions out there in the early days. Now there's still a lot, but there's really like, what, five, depending on your favorite one, six uh, distributions that are, that are popular. We're going to need in our ecosystem collectively to go through that kind of a, uh, a focus, right? So I think the challenge for us as, as an industry is how do we achieve critical mass around a handful of good, solid implementations across different tool chains and so on, but nonetheless establishing that critical mass. And to highlight sort of the nature of the problem or the benefit of the openness, okay, so great, RISC-V ISA is free and open. Lots and lots of cores. So this is a snapshot that I took actually a few months ago, I'm sure the list is longer now, of all of the open source cores that are available implementing the RISC-V ISA, and there's more. And that's, that's, that's a, you know, hallelujah, pass the hot sauce. We've got lots of RISC-V cores. But it, it speaks to the problem of critical mass that I mentioned earlier. Well, it turns out that these, these couple of cores here, and, and the zero risky core, but I want to focus specifically on risky and Ariane, have actually achieved a, an interesting, you know, uh, amount of adoption and, and interest overall from, from the industry. So let's look at that a little further. Actually, probably about a year and a half ago, uh, while I was still solidly wearing my RISC-V uh, executive director hat, I got approached by a handful of people who are on this slide, some of these logos, around helping to set up an organization that was going to support these cores um, and maintain them as open source, basically industry, commercial quality IP, if you will, um, and, and create a nonprofit organization to do that. Obviously, I couldn't do that while I was wearing my RISC-V hat. And literally the day after I took my RISC-V hat off, I got a phone call from one of the larger companies here uh, saying basically, okay, you don't have that as an excuse anymore. Become, a, become an implementer and let's go drive this. Uh, so this is a collection of companies, partners, and sponsors behind the Open Hardware Group, which is a legally registered nonprofit you know, organization specifically around developing open source cores and related IP, which we call the Core 5 family of cores. And the Core 5 family is made up of the Risky and Ariane uh, cores from the great guys at, at ETH Zurich and the Pulp platform. Open Hardware Group, as I said at the outset, I had the pleasure of signing a membership agreement for the first time on the right-hand side of the column. Uh, so Open Hardware Group is a, is a member of the RISC-V Foundation. Um, and, and later this fall, we'll transition those cores out of the uh, Pulp platform GitHub repos into the Open Hardware Group uh, set of GitHub repos and become the official maintainer and committer of those repositories for those cores. So, in case you're not familiar with it, this is the Risky Core. It is a very, very popular core. We'll talk about some of the uh, silicon implementations in a moment. But uh, a real workhorse of a you know, sort of standard 32-bit uh, four-stage pipeline core. Uh, recently added floating point uh, capability and has been used in many, many uh, implementations. And there's a lot more detail on this, both on the Pulp platform site and, and I can get you some collateral as well if you'd like it. But a very, very solid and popular core. And then the Ariane core uh, is uh, also seen a lot of implementations, but this is a, a, a basically an application class GC, RV64 GC uh, core um, that's Linux capable, uh, has, has seen a lot of implementations as well. And uh, you can be clocked up to one and a half gig in, in, uh, in Global Foundries, 22 FDX. So it's, it's very, uh, it's a very interesting core. 
and then on the on the implementation side, uh, the the 12 or so, I think there's 14 actually uh, different tape outs that have happened at ETH uh, and the uh, um, and the lab, uh, the pulp platform guys. Uh, so it's seen silicon many many times. Um, most of these all have, if not all of them, have the uh, the 32-bit RISC-E implementation. Many of them also have Ariane. So there's been quite a few implementations. And then the last two that I put on there with the logos beside them, GreenWaves, uh, the GAP8 product, that's a production product from GreenWaves Technologies uh, that uses the RISC-E core. And then the NXP Vega board, you've probably seen that. NXP announced this, uh, I guess, at the RISC-V Summit last year. Uh, and this is an eval board. Uh, it's not a for production uh, piece of silicon. It's an e eval board that implements the RISC-E core and a zero RISC-E core, for that matter, um, alongside a Cortex-M4 and a Cortex-M0. Uh, so it's a pretty cool little eval board. So that's the core five family, and, and where are we now? So we have a board of directors made up of NXP, Blue Spec, Silicon Labs, and Alibaba Group, uh, and, and myself. Uh, and the board is responsible, obviously, for directing the organization with respect to the bylaws and, and membership agreement and fulfilling its, its ultimate purpose of make, maintaining these ar open source artifacts free and available to all users, not just members. And, and then spinning up these, these uh, task groups, right? So we have a technical working group that's basically the engineering organization for the company, if you will, and a marketing working group. And Within those groups, in particular on the technical side, CORE's task group to drive the roadmap for the CORE's, what we're going to change, what we're going to implement going forward. And there are more CORE's coming. Uh, we've attracted a fair amount of interest in, in this model. Then a verification task group, and I'll talk about that in a second, and a platform task group to produce more things like the Vega board. So the verification task group, one of the things that I talked about earlier when you're going to bet your badge, right, is, is this a solidly verified piece of, uh, piece of code and we're implementing a cloud-based open source verification test bench. We're going to be leveraging and proving this test bench using commercial, uh, uh, commercial CAD tools, um, system Verilog simulators, but also parts of it will be able to run on, on Verilator uh, as well. So it's, it's a very interesting project, and it's obviously contributed by all of the member companies that I showed earlier. Uh, so as a result, we're able to build something that is more comprehensive and more robust than any single organization would do on their own. So we launched the company at the Zurich workshop in June. You may have, uh, when I say company, I'm talking about the Open Hardware Group. It's a nonprofit organization, but it is legally a, a registered company. Uh, so make sure you, you follow us on the social media lists and so on. Status-wise, we are uh, just probably this week or next, ratifying the bylaws and membership agreements uh, together with the early sponsor companies and then being able to open it up to more and more members. So to the, stay on top of things if you're interested, all of these links in the slides are live and you'll have them later, but you can join our mailing list to, to, to stay on top of what's, what's going on. So with that, I can take questions if you'd like. The summary slide just kind of repeats what I just said and let's just stare at the logos for a while. Thank you. Uh, it's actually not really a question. Is I just want to remark that I don't agree with your stance for having permissive license. Um, Retas is often taken as a, an example, and I think they got so great because they copy left at everything they did. Um, I think that's the only way to have a community where everybody is on equal standing. Um, I may be cynical. I'm, I'm in the industry for almost 25 years. And I don't trust corporates when they say, trust us, we will do what you do if there is no legal binding uh, thing to do that. So, and I understand that corporates want prefer permissives. But what, what worries most is that FOSI law is on there. And that gives the impression that also FOSI Foundation is preferring permissive over um, uh, copyleft or licenses. So, and I hope that they don't want to give that impression. So uh, I'll, uh, I'll just make an observation based on my experience. Uh, 
I've had a, I've had a crack at a few open standards uh, uh, in my career, uh, helping to establish them and curate them and so on. And if, if, we, if we want big guys to participate with little guys, it needs to be incentive-based from, uh, from a business value standpoint as opposed to legally enforcing. There's just way too much IP that scares the crap out of the big guys that would, if we were trying to force them into a license model other than permissive, we won't get them to the table, my experience. And if we don't get them to the table, we won't get the global adoption that we're really looking for so that all people can participate. That's just my experience. Maybe to your last part about the Fossil Foundation, of course we are neutral, right? So we have always been, will always be neutral. We don't take a position here because I think even among the board members, there's uh, different opinions on different occasions when to use what. Like all of us, we use different kinds of licenses, sometimes permissive. We have used a lot of copyleft recently, uh, before, but don't use anymore, some of us. In the end, it's personal decisions. Here it's company decisions, but Fossil Foundation can still like. <laughs> so it would be very exclusive from my point of view to say, because you only want permissive, we will not work with you. That's stupid, in my opinion. Like, it's a decision. And in this case, it's a business decision, mostly. <laughs> Pretty much, right? And it's okay, right? Um, yeah. So I hope the message is not that we say, like, everything has to be permissive. I think this is not transported by this slide. Uh, having had the wonderful opportunity of formally verifying some risk five cores um, to include the risky core that you work with or that you mentioned is there a reason why uh, you haven't mentioned formal verification at all in your verification strategy uh, are you intending to use formal verification or to hopefully just get lucky with uh, someone who believes in formal verification picking up a core and uh, demonstrating what you're missing Okay, so a couple, uh, couple of questions in there. I'll start with the last one first. I don't really believe in luck, so no, we're not hoping to get lucky. Uh, and, and to the fr earlier question, absolutely, we have a formal strategy that we're baking right now and not quite ready to, 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 to chat about it. As we open up, so th where we are, this group of companies have come to the table to help define the governance model and what we think we should focus on. So that's the activity that's going on with these sponsor companies. We're, we're just about ready to ratify membership agreement and bylaws. And by the way, we, we pretty much invited everybody to join the sponsor group. The people who are really passionate about it have. Um, we'll be opening, opening up the discussion to define what the verification strategy needs to be. And formal is absolutely in there. You can probably recognize that there's some formal folks at the table already. Uh, so I see two big implements there, H-Silicon and NXP. Are they going to give you uh, their microarchitecture licenses? Because the ISA is open, but all microarchitecture is patented. Yeah. Right. So the implementation actually is coming from the guys at ETH Zurich, right? And those, that's released under SOLDERPAD, a permissively licensed, govern, a permissive license governed actually by the FASI Foundation. So. Um, those are, that's where those implementations are coming from. But they might be, but they might be you know, violating patents. And there, I see two implements there yep. that could hold some patents. Yep. Are they, uh, yep. no, good know. question. So if you're a student of the RIS-5 membership agreement, you will recognize in that uh, membership agreement that there is a covenant not to sue paragraph in, for everyone who has signed a RIS-5 foundation agreement. And now there's upwards of 300 members, companies. So when you think about it that way, 300 people in the semiconductor and systems industry have signed a covenant not to sue around RISC V um, agreement. Uh, it's almost like a large patent pool. And the membership agreement that we have here in the Open Hardware Group closely mirrors that. There's also a no suit or proceedings covenant in, in those membership agreements. And that's, that's basically how we get around that, or how we address it. Olaf, I think we have to take a moment and comment on how spectacular you look with that tie. <laughs> Thank you, Rick. Oh. <laughs> Did you have a question or you just wanted the mic? <laughs> <laughs> a bit of both. 
so my question was, um, uh, has there been any tape outs? Do you, can you comment on if there are any planned tape outs from this group with, with the work you're doing? It's always good to point to examples when people ask. Yeah, so um, we haven't actually started operation yet until the bylaws and membership agreements are ratified. Um, but we have plans for uh, tape out in, in 2020 that will include both the Ariana and Risky course. And we're still trying to finalize those plans so we can talk about them and invite more people to participate. And also, uh, I see that there were no bit serial cores. Uh, is that a gap in the Core 5 family? Well, I, I, can't, I can't imagine where we could get some of those if anyone wanted to contribute something. Like that. I don't know. I, I kind of fancy to AMD 29K uh, slice machines, you know. Hey, Rick, looking at um, the material you presented, it seems like the bulk of the work that the Open Hardware Group is going to be doing is taking some existing open source cores and increasing the quality, the verification quality and maybe the PPA quality. Um, how, how, how is that going to happen? Is the Open Hardware Group going to employ engineers uh, and they all work together on GitHub or something? Or is this member companies taking bits of that work and contributing it back uh, under the kind of organizational aegis of the Open Hardware Group? Or how's that makeup going to work? So good question. Uh, short answer is yes, right? So it's an and, uh, not an or. Um, the way that the Open Hardware Group is constituted, we're using roughly a ratio of one to four internal Open Hardware Group engineers for every four contributed engineers from members. So it's sort of a, um, uh, oh geez, what's the software organization I'm thinking of? Never mind. Um, pardon me? No, no, no. no uh, it, so we have a, a, um, um, an implementation model, like I said, where we have in, so internal resources at a ratio of one to four. So part of the membership agreement uh, that uh, corporate signs up to is based on the size of the company, what their dollar commitment is, and how many FTEs, full-time equivalents, we call them active contributors, that that company contributes. And we will be creating, if you will, virtual teams out of the member contributed resources and the internal resources that we hire inside the open hardware group uh, to, to create those teams. One of the reasons for that is the member company resources will come and go, depending on the projects inside their company. Um, but clearly, these cores will live on for quite a long time and hopefully have a useful life to be adopted into, into new designs. So the resources that are inside the open hardware group will continue to maintain and support those cores uh, going forward. And it's not just about a contributed core that gets improved and verified. There will also be some sort of ground up development from the uh, member company and internal resources as well. Oh.